Hello, and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is another hot summer Monday. I'm Amanda Carpenter, joined by my colleague, Will Salatan. Will, how was your weekend? Uh, my weekend was was fine. I'm like, it's weird. I'm like, you know, last week we were talking about I had COVID. So now I'm sort of dealing with the aftermath of COVID and finding out that Joe Biden had COVID. I felt this sort of surge of sympathy for him. So Joe, hope you're hope you're good within a week. So how are you recovering? Are you back to normal? Kind of half half? I can tell I'm sort of half half. Like, I, I mean, I'm done with the symptoms of except for like, yeah, I can tell I'm talking too low. My the register, my voice is down. And I'm sure it's gonna like, I've, I've talked to other people who've been through this. So like, you get through with the disease, but then you're sort of dealing with your body recovering from it. And I'm just trying to imagine what you know, at practically 80 years old, in Joe Biden's case, what it's going to be like for him. I think it's going to be hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. We we shall see. Maybe we'll all just have like lower voices and we'll just sound like a little bit sexier and raspier on the radio. <laughs> like Barack is, Obama. Is that the right. silver lining here? Yes, you know, Amanda, if I can get the Obama voice without the cigarettes, I will be so happy. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I don't know if you'll still be recovering in 2023, but there's I think a book you might want to put on your reading list. Did you know Josh Hawley has a book coming out in 2023? Is it called Fleeing for Your Life? It is not. It is uh, about the title. I, I honestly, I'm not making this up. And I actually saw this flag by Bill Crystal. I thought it was a joke. The title is Manhood, The Masculine <laughs> Virtues America Needs. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that I, you, awesome? We don't have to go into this today, but like the whole idea of what these guys have done to the idea of masculinity, um, it's 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 going to be like culturally fascinating for future generations. Yeah, it is. It is a big deal. He was giving speeches, I think, at the you know national conservative, whatever, whatever, about how masculinity is under attack. And so he's been on this gig for quite a while. Um, makes wants to make it you know a central part of his maybe campaign platform going forward. But I think I think I think that image took a hit <laughs> in the hearing on Thursday. And so what I really want to talk to you about today, Will, is what is going to happen as a result of these hearings going forward. It was really remarkable to listen to the way that Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger talked about this on the Sunday shows. And so just let's listen to some sound from Adam Kinzinger and then Liz Cheney. We never want to, and this is important, we never want to get in a position as a country what you see in failed democracies where every last administration is prosecuted. But there is a massive difference between I'm going to prosecute the last administration for political vengeance and not prosecuting an administration that literally attempted a failed coup. Uh, that, is a, that is a precedent I'm way more concerned about, is if there is evidence that this happened from a judicial perspective, if there's the ability to move forward on prosecuting and you don't, you have basically set the floor for future behavior of any president. And I don't think a democracy can survive that. So I certainly hope they're moving forward. I certainly think there's evidence of crimes, and I think uh, it goes all the way up to Donald Trump. And now Liz Cheney. There's no doubt in my mind that the president of the United States is unfit for further office. Uh, any, any man who would conduct themselves, or woman, who would conduct themselves the way that he did in attempting to overturn an election and stay in power must never again be anywhere close to the Oval Office. So, well, you know, what they're talking about here are items that I don't think we are prepared to truly grapple with as a country. Do you think we are seriously ready to prosecute a former president? I don't know if we're ready to do that. I, I think Kinsinger makes an excellent point, though, which is, and as somebody who's been reluctant to advocate prosecuting Trump, Kinsinger is talking about a principle that Republicans understand in the in the area of foreign policy, which is deterrence. Right? You you have to send a message that something won't be tolerated, that there are consequences to pay, or the behavior will repeat itself. So what he's saying is. If we look the other way, if we don't prosecute somebody who attempted a coup on our country, it'll happen again. And I think that's a very legitimate point and one that conservatives ought to listen to. Yeah. And so, you know, truly, we have three tracks that are available ahead. The Department of Justice can prosecute uh, politically. Voters can reject Trump again, although nothing will stop him from getting on the ballot unless what do you think it's an option for Congress to contemplate impeaching him again 
based on all the new evidence coming forward. And I realize that sounds crazy, but I do think we are in a bit of a predicament if Congress doesn't do anything after uncovering all this new evidence in light of what's happened over the last year. I mean, how can we ignore it? What The Adam Kinzinger question really gets me thinking. What happens if we go through with this investigation, finding out all this material about his fundamental unfitness for office, and nobody does anything to disqualify him, and he does become a candidate, and he does win? How can we do nothing, but at the same time, how can we do something so radical as to maybe impeach him again in an attempt to disqualify him from office? What do you think? Well, they're not going to impeach him. They're not going to impeach him because they didn't do it the first time, and they're not going to switch well, the on House that. House did impeach. I, this is just sort of where my thinking is. The House could impeach him again for the record to say, as a body, we believe, according to these new facts, again, he is fundamentally unfit for office and should be disqualified as such. I'm just throwing it out there. This is, I mean, honestly, this is a thought experiment. I'm not necessarily advocating for it, but these are the questions that I have. Right. Well, I, I don't think they're going to do it, in, in part because they're going to get the same result in the Senate, which is they're, they're not going to get a conviction. You know, evidence is not going to move Republicans at this point. I mean, part of what's so bizarre here, especially when we're talking about, you know, Josh Hawley talking about masculinity, is that Congress is showing no courage here. Republicans are showing no courage, that is to say. They're putting it on us, on the voters. They're basically saying, you know, we're not going to intervene in this. We're going to let them run again. And we're counting on somehow the Republican electorate choosing somebody else, or we're, we're counting on swing voters not voting for Trump if he's the nominee. I mean, you saw in the hearings, Amanda, even Republicans who were testifying against Trump were not, you know, Rusty Bowers, you know, not being willing to come out and say, I will, you know, definitely vote against Trump if he's the nominee. So there's just a massive failure of courage from the political class of the Republican Party. And they're either counting on Republican rank and file, the primary voters, or on the general election voters to rescue them from that. Yeah, I guess what I'm thinking of, and I openly soliciting ideas from the Bulwark audience and feedback on this question, is what happens when the January 6th committee report is finalized and we get this book-length document documenting Trump's dereliction of duty. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. What do we do then? Do we say, oh, well, that was that was a scary story and put it on the shelf and move on? I mean, can there be a vote to accept the findings of the report? Because when you speak about Republican cowardice, you know, I think of someone like Mitch McConnell, who looks at all this evidence coming out and says, you know what, I'm not going to say anything until the final report comes out. Well, you know what that's going to be? Uh, I wish there was more Republican input, blah, 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 blah. I want that question to be forced on them. How do you, Mitch McConnell, ignore all this testimony from people who are hardcore Republicans who are served in the Trump administration? I just, I think that question has to be posed in terms of some kind of vote or resolution for the record to, you know, to put a final point on this. Because, Again, you can't just say we found all this evidence and we hope the Department of Justice does something. I think Congress has a responsibility to do something more as a body in and of itself with this evidence. Well, I agree with you. I mean, Congress should have done it the first time they had a chance to impeach him and I mean, to convict him and keep him from running again. Um, they didn't do it. I don't think they'll do it again. And I think it's interesting that the way that Liz Cheney is talking about this, because all of Liz Cheney's comments, she keeps talking about how unfit Trump is to be president again. I don't think, I mean, she would love for there to be an indictment and a conviction of Donald Trump or the people around him. But I think the way she keeps talking is she just wants to establish a record that will move enough voters to see the truth about Trump and his unfitness and his dangerousness that will literally just prevent him from being president again. That's a very low bar, but it's really important, obviously. And so I don't think that she is aiming for Congress to do anything much as that would be great. Um, I think she's just aiming to reach enough people to make a political difference. I do think she is holding out hope of some kind of indictment and prosecution, because when you listen to her in interviews, 
you know, they're constantly asked about the question of criminal referrals, which I, I don't necessarily think is their responsibility. But hey, if you have evidence of a crime, I don't know how you could not make a referral because that would sort of be feeling down on your duties as an investigator. But that that's a debatable question. What she does repeatedly point to is that decision from Judge Carter about uh, overturning the Eastman emails, uh, because Judge Carter, in that opinion, said that he believed that there was evidence of the president committing crimes. Those were attempted obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy to interfere with the election certification process. And so she points like a bright light to his opinion quite a bit. Do you think that's significant? Yeah, I do. I do. The, uh, I think th- uh, the committee is leaning too hard on Judge Carter. They, they need more than that. But I think that's a clue to what, the way th- what they're thinking. The other thing that I noticed, Amanda, was Cheney was on one of the talk shows, uh, a couple of talk shows this, mm-hmm. this Sunday, and so was Adam Schiff. And I thought it was interesting, the quotes that they chose to reference. Liz Cheney talked about Steve Bannon's, the, the Bannon tape, where Steve Bannon says, uh, Trump is going to come out and say he won no matter what the results were, right? Mm-hmm. And then Schiff cited Trump saying to the Justice Department officials, look, you guys just come out and say that you just say the election was full of fraud and I'll take it from there. And the the reason I think those quotes are interesting is both of those quotes go to Trump's state of mind. So I think that Schiff and Cheney and Kinzinger and all these folks recognize that the weakest point of the case against Donald Trump is his state of mind. That is, he is... I got to admit, Amanda, I believe that Trump is delusional. I believe that Trump, he, he really? you know, yeah, absolutely. I, and I, it's functionally equivalent to lying because people say to your face, uh, Mr. President, there's no evidence of this. No, that's not true. The suitcase, that's not a suitcase, et cetera. So you really think that he really believes he won the election? Is that what you mean by delusional? Yes. I think that for Donald Trump, belief is not what it means to you or me or other ordinary people. Well, I think he's just committed to the act. <laughs> He's okay. like a method actor. <laughs> and I don't know if functionally we would be able to distinguish between your theory and mine. I mean, if you look at his behavior, it's just that I'm not sure that you could get a conviction that requires him to understand that he was lying because he is so pathological in his in, in his inability to distinguish truth from falsehood. I, I just don't know about it. So I think those quotes that they're using make your case. They make the case that he knew he was lying. He knew he was going to say something, whether or not it was true. And that can sort of help solidify the legal case against him. Yeah, but also it, it doesn't matter if you believe the lie or not, if you still acted in a conspiracy to interfere with the election certification process. Like, I don't think it matters what your you know state of mind was in particular when you acted to summon the mob and deploy them to Congress to stop the peaceful transfer of power, right? Right? Like you still did the bad thing. Like you picked up, yes. you know, you committed the act. And that act is what matters, even though I'm not a lawyer, but that seems to make sense to me. No, I think you're exactly right there. I mean, first of all, on the question we're debating, you know, there's some legal concept of willful blindness that I don't fully understand, but there are mm-hmm. lawyers who believe that even if I am correct about his, you know, continuing to believe lies in the face of truth. It doesn't matter. He's legally responsible. But I think your point, you're adding the other part of the equation, which is manifestly, as the Thursday hearing demonstrated, what he did was deeply immoral. What he did was was wrong and was, you know, unconstitutional and illegal. And I got to say, Amanda, I don't know if you want to go into this, but I found that hearing absolutely fascinating as a portrait of narcissism. And, you know, we, we've been talking about this guy being a narcissist for five or six years, but what we saw in that hearing was the unbelievably grotesque, dangerous consequences of the narcissism, of his inability to think about anybody but himself and his own political interests. What moment stands out to you? Because I, th- I think that is a defining factor of his personality and the way that he governs. But what demonstrated that terrible personality trait best? I mean, so they're talking about the 187 minutes. They're talking about him being in that study off the the Oval Office and, you know, watching TV and everybody coming in and telling him, um, you know, terrible things are happening out there. There's an attack going on in the Capitol. By the way, your vice president, the guy who stood by you for four years, is in serious danger over there. And of course, we heard, you know, the the Secret Service talk over there, people calling their families. They thought they were possibly going to die. So he's being told all this. By the way, Kevin McCarthy is calling him and telling him, you know, according to Jamie Herrera Butler, 
Kevin McCarthy is literally calling Donald Trump and telling him in the phone call, I, I, people in my staff are running for their lives. So it's a mortal threat to everybody. And Donald Trump is not doing anything about that. But what he's spending his time doing, according to the timeline as laid out by the committee and the evidence, is calling senators, right, mm -hmm. and calling Rudy Giuliani, because all Donald Trump is thinking about during this 187 minutes is, can he still overturn the election? It's all about him staying in power. And even being told that people are in mortal threat and violence is going on and that it's happening at the capital of his country is not moving him. So <clears throat> to me, that's what the narcissism came down to. It is, he was willing to let people die caring only about himself. Hey, 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 BA fam. It's Tiffany and Mandy from the Brown and Bish podcast. And we have some exciting news for you. For the first time ever, we are going live on YouTube. When? Head to www.youtube.com slash Cumulus Podcast at noon Eastern on July 28th to join us, Brown Ambition, live. If you haven't heard, July 28th is when we get our first clues as to whether or not we are really in a recession. And who better to break it all down than your personal financial sisters? If you have a question about the recession, we got your back. The Brown Ambition Live Recession Reaction Show Thursday, July 28th, noon Eastern on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts after that. Well, well, you just touched on, you know, a number of figures that I think are going to be important going forward with this investigation who don't happen to be named Trump. And they're all related. It has to do with Mike Pence's life being in that mortal danger, as you pointed out, Kevin McCarthy and the missing Secret Service text. As we talked about last week, you know, those missing Secret Service texts are so, so instrumental to get because this is really the first time their duties to protect the president and vice president came into conflict because the president essentially ordered a hit on Congress and the vice president. I, I, mean, I just don't think we think about that enough. And we so we knew that was going to be a big deal going into the Thursday hearing, but I did not expect to hear that sound from the security official talking about how the Secret Service felt their lives were in danger. And I'm going to play that sound. And it's a little garbled because I think they tried to mask the voice. But I really think we should just stick on this for a minute and think about what these words mean. Okay. That last entry in this page is, sir, the Capitol does not sound good right now. Correct. What does that mean? Uh Members of the BPT tell at this time were starting to fear for their own lives. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot of yelling, um, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of very personal calls um, over the radio. So uh, it was disturbing. I don't I'm like talking about it, but um, uh, there were calls to um, say goodbye to family members, so on and so forth. It was getting. For, for whatever the reason was on the ground, the BPT tell thought that this was about to get very ugly. And, do you, and did you hear that over the radio? Right. Okay. What was the response by the agents who, Secret Service agents who were there? Is Everybody there? kept saying, you know, at that point it was just reassurances or, or um, I, I think there were discussions of reinforcements coming, but at, at, again, it, it was just chaos. They were just yelling. They obviously to me, this so disturbing, but what... What prompted you to put it into an entry as it states their service to the council? They're running out of options and they're getting nervous. It, it, it sounds like we're, that we came very close to either service having to use legal options or, or worse. Like, I, I, at that point, I don't know. Is the VP compromised? Is the detail kind of, like, I, I don't know. Like, we didn't have visibility, but it doesn't. If they're screaming and, and saying things like, say goodbye to the family, like, the floor needs to know this is going to on a whole nother level soon. All right. Again, I apologize for that sound. It is a little shaky, but every time I listen to it, my stomach just turns. Well, it's it sort of dramatizes that lives were in danger. And of course, lives were eventually lost. We had officers died as a result. We had somebody, climb, you know, Ashley Babbitt climbing through the window, get shot. It was a horrible day. And, you know, Amanda, try to imagine if this attack on the vice president of the United States and his security detail came from, say, you know, Islamic terrorists, there would be 
no question in the Republican Party about, you know, <laughs> that this was a, an awful moment that whoever instigated this needed to be hunted down. Uh, whoever was sort of the jihadist, you know, propagandist behind this, we would want to know the whole network. But in this case, the network is not an Islamic network. The network is Donald Trump and his people. And it's kind of shocking, the silence of the Republican Party, when the people who are, you know, attacking our vice president happen to be their people, happen to be Republicans and Trump supporters, to me exposes a massive blind spot. Also, of course, the fact that, you know, Trump billed himself as, you know, standing for police and they're, they're the party of law and order. And then when actual officers are under threat, the Secret Service is under threat, officers are being beaten up, officers are dying. Um, you know, there. I think, was it Elaine Luria? They pointed out that Trump never mentioned the names of these officers who fell and who died as a result, as a result of this and the ones who were injured. And he, he just never acknowledged it. So there's this massive moral blind spot when the people who commit the terrorism or the violence are white nationalists or Trump supporters or Republicans. Yeah. And I've always been pretty negative uh, towards Mike Pence and the whole hero debate because of the role that he played in enabling all of these lies that culminated to the mob attack. But imagining him in this scenario takes my disdain to an entirely new level. He was there listening to Secret Service call their family members and say goodbye. We've seen the pictures of him hiding out. Mike Pence was there with his wife and daughter as this was happening. So, I mean, I, I can't imagine the people who are there to protect you feel like it's going to be over and they have to call their loved ones to say goodbye. He is there with his loved ones. And now he still will not talk to the committee about what happened. Now he still goes on the campaign trail and talks about it was the honor of his life to serve with Donald Trump. I do not understand what kind of mindset leads you to just block out all of those terrible, damning details that happened to him. I, I, can you wrap your head around that? Well, I, I, I can't pretend to understand Mike Pence. I think it in his, you know, kind of twisted way, he is, he is trying to sort of now separate himself from, from Trump. We can talk about, you know, what they're doing on the campaign trail, campaigning for different candidates. But Pence obviously thinks that whatever needs to be said about Trump's legacy and about January 6th will be said by others. And that is consistent with the general pattern of cowardice in the Republican Party, that somebody else will do the job. Somebody else will say what needs to be said. Liz Cheney will say it for us, and then we'll try to you know, get rid of her in her primary. Um, the voters will take care of it for us, for the primary voters, the general election voters. But we're not going to be the ones to say it because, honestly, Amanda, they just don't have the courage. Yeah, 100%. But in terms of the investigation, and for Mike Pence, who is someone that holds himself out there as someone who cares about the Constitution and rule of law, I have constitutional questions about what happened that day. Because while Trump was in the dining room watching TV, Mike Pence was ordering the military to take action. Let's listen to this clip from Mark Milley, who talks about what Mike Pence was doing in those hours. Vice President Pence, there were th uh, two or three calls with Vice President Pence. He was very animated, and he issued very explicit, uh, very direct, unambiguous orders. There was no question about that. And, and he was, and, and, and I can get you the exact quotes, I guess, from some of our records somewhere, but he was very animated, very direct, very firm uh, and to Secretary Miller. Get the military down here. Get the guard down here. Put down this uh, situation, uh, etc. So that may have been the right thing to do, but can a vice president actually do that? What What was going on? Well, obviously, somebody had to be had to function as president of the United States, and the president wasn't going to do it. So the vice president did. I, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, honestly, Amanda, it's kind of a de facto Twenty Fifth Amendment when the vice president does what the right, president wants to do. Like, that is a huge deal. If he was getting on the phone ordering the military to come right. in just because, like, 
that is worth an investigation of itself, right? Yeah, but no one's going to hold it against Mike Pence that he did the job of president. And by the way, you know, on the subject of, you know, what kind of credit do we give Mike Pence? I'm happy to have the legend of Mike Pence as the guy who did the right thing, didn't overturn the election and all that, even, even if he didn't then, you know, follow through and do many other things that a, an honorable person would have done. But I was really struck by watching Al Gore doing a couple uh, doing a couple of interviews this weekend. Al Gore basically, you know, people said to Al Gore, you know, when you lost the presidency to George W. Bush, you nobly stu stood aside and conceded the election to him. And Gore's response was basically like, you know, that's kind of just in the Constitution. That was just kind of basic. That's not like heroic on my part. And that's kind of the way I think we should feel about Pence. You know, Pence did very basic things. So in the situations that you're describing here, Amanda, he, you know, made the phone calls that a president should make. The very basic stuff that someone whose job was to defend the United States and who was going to be serious about the presidential oath would have done. Um, it's not heroic, but it's basic and it's what we needed. I'm glad he did it. Yeah, I just, it speaks to the overall level of chaos that, you know, maybe we had a de facto 25th Amendment. Uh, maybe the vice president was taking control of the government. Again, the right call to do. But I, it is just the implications of what took place that day and the fact he won't talk about it is it just, will never not be stunning to me. But there was another moment in the hearing uh, while Pence was on the phone trying to get the National Guard to come in. Uh, you saw photos of congressional leaders huddled around a phone talking with acting defense secretary Chris Miller, trying to find a way to finish the business of the day, certify the election, and put this all behind us. But I, I wrote about this last week. There is a person that is curiously missing from those photos, and that is Republican leader Kevin McCarthy. We know Kevin McCarthy spoke to Trump that day. They played the clips of what he said in interviews. We know that Kevin McCarthy lied to his fellow Republican leaders about whether he would ask him to resign. We know that Kevin McCarthy felt directly back in line, went down to Mar-a-Lago by the end of January 2021 to declare that the president is more popular than ever and essentially say, he's still our guy. But I think people have forgotten that the January 6th committee has asked Kevin to speak to them voluntarily. He didn't. They actually issued a subpoena, which he continues to defy today. And going from what they showed us in the last hearing, I have questioned, what was Kevin McCarthy doing that day? He was talking to Trump, but he didn't appear to be a part of the conversations to finish the work. And we know that he joined the other Republicans and not certifying the election for Biden by supporting the objections. And so the fact that he is very likely to become Speaker of the House is very disturbing to me because it seems like he's getting away with a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, McCarthy's not going to testify, of course, because he's totally invested in the idea that the committee is illegitimate. I mean, he pulled his three picks for the committee after the two of them were rejected for good reasons. He's basically been trying to sabotage the whole thing, and he doesn't want to give any credence to anything that comes out of the committee. So that's never going to happen. Um, and as you're pointing out, first of all, McCarthy is more responsible than anyone else for reviving Donald Trump when they had a chance to, I mean, all of these guys, what's part of what's galling about the cowardice is they had their chance to get rid of him and get rid of him for very good reasons that what he had done was unconstitutional and dangerous. And, and they didn't do it. And McCarthy went and revived Trump. And now McCarthy is left pleading somehow that he has to do this. He has to, you know, suck up to Trump and he has to defend Trump because Trump is powerful. But Trump is powerful because McCarthy saved him. So McCarthy is doubly guilty on that. And no, I don't I don't expect any any cooperation or any truth from Kevin McCarthy. It's noteworthy, by the way, this is a distinction between McCarthy and Mitch McConnell. And I'm going to get tomatoes thrown at me for saying this, but Mitch McConnell has not sold out to the extent that Kevin McCarthy has. Mitch McConnell said what, what, he, what everything he said about Donald Trump in whatever that speech was, February of 2021, about January 6th. He absolutely nailed what, who Trump was and what Trump had done, and he did not go sucking up to Trump. Um, McCarthy, God knows McConnell has not been as brave as he should be, but he has not bowed and scraped the way McCarthy has. So aside from Trump and Pence and McCarthy, there are a few threads that will continue to remain outstanding in terms of this investigation. Uh, I thought I'm just going to rattle through a couple of these. 
that I noticed uh, from the Sunday shows. Uh, Cheney in particular said that she anticipates talking to more members of Trump's cabinet and campaign. So go ahead and start placing bets on who those figures may be. She named Ginny Thomas in particular as someone that she continued to hope would voluntarily cooperate with the committee, but they would, quote, contemplate subpoenas if Ginny Thomas does not. Uh, Of course, they will continue to try to interview members of the Secret Service. And then additionally, the Department of Justice is opening a criminal investigation into those purge messages. So which of those, take your pick, has the most legs for you, Will? Well, I'm kind of fascinated by the idea of the interviewing other cabinet members. First of all, the alley that I'm very interested in the committee going down was what went on behind the scenes in terms of preparing to invoke the 25th Amendment. All right, we know that this was going on backstage. We know from, you know, Sean Hannity's tweet and others, other evidence that, you know, that Trump was being told, you got to do more to speak out against what just happened. And the reason you got to do more is not because you have any principles, you don't, but because you're afraid you you might get 25th Amendment, which was, which was definitely what was going on. So during this hearing, one of the things that was revealed, at least to me, I wasn't aware of it before, was that when Trump made the video on January 7th, a follow-up video sort of denouncing the violence as far as he would go, he did so under, under duress. And the duress was that if he didn't do it, the cabinet might invoke the 25th Amendment. So I'm very interested in whether the committee can find out more about what the cabinet was doing and how that might have prompted Trump to say what he did. Because so far, it appears that every time Donald Trump on January 6th or January 7th said something like, there needs to be peace, or people need to go home, or this was wrong, it was all done under threat, not because he ever understood that what was happening was wrong. Which does show when Republicans do push back on Trump, he can be forced into taking action. I'm not saying the video was worth anything. I, I it, it didn't do anything. I, that was just kind of a dumb request. But when you do push back, he does sometimes react. Um, and on the other outstanding thread that's going to play out probably over the next few months, the Ginny Thomas thing. Listen, I'm not so much interested in Ginny Thomas testifying because she's Ginny Thomas, but I don't want to let go of this fraudulent elector scheme because what that really does speak to is the rot that gets down to the party at the state level. And this was an effort that was coordinated by the Trump campaign that the leader of the Republican National Committee and Ronna Romney McDaniel was involved with. And then these figures like Ginny Thomas. And they held these fake ceremonies in secret to produce these false documents to send to Congress to try to flip the election. And the fact that you just have, I think it's 80-some people that sign their names to this, I strongly believe there has to be criminal consequences for what they did because it's just laid out on paper. Yeah, you know, so Amanda, to me, this gets to this very large question that I am wrestling with, and I don't know if anybody else is, um, and that is, to what extent is presenting arguments that are basically false, to what extent is it prosecutable? So, for example, so in this whole January 6th conspiracy, we have the fake electors, right? And some of these people will claim, and some of them are will claim accurately that they thought they were quote contingent electors right so they're not they're not exactly lying they say um it's just that if they could get the votes the the uh, popular vote in their state to be overturned or the certification overturned say by the legislature or the governor then they would be legitimate electors not fake electors or you have these sort of, you know, the, can, can Trump get a letter from some official in the Department of Justice? Can he elevate Jeffrey Clark and get some letter that says there was fraud in the election, which they can then use to overturn the election? He, he's calling Georgia, right? Can, can, we get some, can we get fake results here? Can we find me 11,000 votes and then I'll win the state? So all of this stuff is deceit, deception, trying to construct an alternate reality. And the result of it, if any of it succeeds, is a coup. So can you prosecute people like these fake electors for participating in a coup when they're going to claim, you know, hey, it would have all been legal if the vote in my state had been decertified? Yeah, I just think it's an open shut case that you submitted false documents to Congress and that's fraud, right? Just plain reading of the law, 
don't get into the state of mind. What you did was submit false documents to Congress, and we we can't abide by that. So I, I think you're right there. I think the false documents are the best evidence, and that's why the people who understand how to prosecute this stuff, unlike me, I'm just being a pundit, uh, are going for that, right? It's a piece of paper. It's and we don't have to we don't have to debate what you said. It's written right here. You can say that you thought you were a contingent elector, but that's not what you signed right here. You signed that you were the actual elector and that that is fraud. And even, even if we can't get you for anything else, we can't get you for being a coup plotter, we can't get you for being an authoritarian, we're going to get you for fraud, we're going to get you for lying. What do you think about the pair of editorials that came down from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post last week, essentially, you know, criticizing Trump in very strong terms? for his actions on January 6th. Were you surprised by that? Do you think it matters? Is it a sign of anything? Well, Amanda, I got to admit, as a lifelong pundit, I've never believed that editorial writers count for much. Oh, burn. I'm sorry. I mean, we, I've spent, you know, years and years writing opinions that I, and I've founded on evidence and I don't believe I actually move people. I, I, I would like to hope that these sort of party organs, like the Wall Street Journal is something that'll, the sort of intellectual class of the conservative movement reads. But Amanda, is that even true anymore? I mean, with the rise of Trump, you know, we know that the sort of the Republican establishment has sort of collapsed and dissipated. Is that also true of the Republican, the conservative media establishment? Does anyone read the Wall Street Journal editorial page anymore? Yeah, I think they definitely do. I don't think it's as influential to Republican primary voters as they might hope they're going to be. But I am going to disagree with you on on this pretty strongly in that I do think it is a sign that the January 6th series have had an effect. I mean, they would not have been writing these editorials had it not been for that Thursday hearing. But even more than that is the fact that Brett Baer on Fox News Sunday actually had Liz Cheney on to make her case, which I thought was very interesting. You know, these shows, they do you know, push a particular point of view when they choose their interview subjects. And there was a blackout for a while on all things related to January 6th on that channel. And here you have on the premiere Sunday show, Liz Cheney being interviewed as a guest. And I understand Brett Baer is not Tucker Carlson. He's not Laura Ingraham. He's probably, you know, viewed as one of the squishier guys there. But that's saying something. Yeah, well, you know, I continue to believe, and folks who read The Bulwark and folks who work at The Bulwark continue to believe, there should exist such a thing as a non-insane Republican Party, right? There should be there should be people who are conservative on policy, as Liz Cheney certainly is, and uh, don't base everything they say on lies, as Donald Trump does, and who don't support coups. Um, and even if this is sort of this region of the political sphere is is uninhabited for reasons of cowardice by people like, you know, Josh Hawley. It should exist. And Liz Cheney exists there. She inhabits it. Adam Kinzinger inhabits it. If you are going to have a conservative media sphere that isn't deranged um, and something that that might actually be persuasive to people who aren't already part of the cult, then you should have Liz Cheney on your show. You should have Adam Kinzinger on your show and you should have other, you know, conservatives who just are not part of are not part of the cult. Listen, there was part of what was explained that Brett Baer did find very persuasive because after he interviewed Liz Cheney, he went on Howard Kurtz's media show and Brett Baer was the guest to give his reaction to what was happening. And let's take a listen to that. That said, laying out all of these 187 minutes makes him look horrific. It really does. And it's it's for everybody to see. And the president's inaction and the vice president's action getting on the phone is very telling. Uh, but critics of this committee will always come back to, why not allow cross-examination? Why not have another side that has a defense of the target that you're going after? Yeah, and I'll come back to that. But to me, the most chilling moment was the Secret Service radio traffic about saying goodbye to their families. And at the time, President Trump putting out a tweet about Mike Pence lacks courage. Yeah. And listen, of course, they're going to soft pedal elements of this to say, oh, we wish there was Republicans on the committee, blah, blah, blah. But there you have Brett Baer talking about how it was horrific to watch what Donald Trump did. You have Howard Kurtz talking about how he's moved by the Secret Service. You know, that came after the New York Post and Wall Street Journal editorial. And so whenever anybody needs a talking point about how these committees 
hearings are breaking through, you can point to those people because as we have learned through this process, it is the Republicans who testify, who come out publicly and talk about why this is damaging, who are the most persuasive and are getting through to those Trump voters who now suddenly say they want to move on. That's just my theory of the case. No, I think that's true. I think those Republican voices are crucial. And it's very clear that Liz Cheney understands that and that she has made sure that the people who are speaking at these hearings are former Trump supporters, are Republicans, are conservatives. So that, you know, the, the audience that needs to be reached is not me. The audience that needs to be reached is people who might vote Republican, who might vote for Donald Trump for president if he's the Republican nominee. And how can we reach them and show them that you don't have to vote for this craziness to be to be conservative? I mean, Part of what's fascinating to me about that comment from from Brett Baer is, you know, he says, you know, there's no other side in these hearings. Why isn't there another side? Mm -hmm. But in the course of talking about it, he names the other side. And it's this the side that Liz Cheney has constructed, um, which is he, you know, Baer says the president's inaction on January 6th. But then he says in the same breath, the vice president's action, right? Mm -hmm. Pence is the other side. Pence is the conservative, the, the guy who was there at Trump's side the whole time, but who did the right thing on January 6th, who didn't subscribe to the lies, who did activate, you know, the National Guard, who did try to defend the United States, the, defend the Capitol. And I think it's absolutely crucial that there is another side represented that is not the left. It's not the left. It's the Pence Republican Party, or it's the Liz Cheney Republican Party. It's some kind of conservatism that isn't Trumpism. Yeah, I think you're right. And that really makes me think about what's playing out in Arizona right now. Have you followed this? Um, yeah, I guess people are playing it up as a proxy war between Trump and Pence in terms of gubernatorial endorsements. Trump, of course, has endorsed the <laughs> bat crap crazy Carrie Lake, who essentially threatens to jail any political opponents. And then you have a number of, you know, Pence-type Republicans coalescing around this other candidate, uh, Karen Taylor Robson, as the more responsible alternative. And I think that's going a little bit far because she doesn't really say the election was secure. There was nothing wrong with it. She does play a, some games and does the sort of dance that, well, well, something went wrong. But Pence was there over the weekend to stump for her, while Trump was also in Arizona Stumping for Carrie Lake, who I just checked it this morning, according to the Real Clear Politics average, is favored by 8.5 points in that race. The two candidates, first of all, Carrie and Karen, right? Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so, so I mean, I'll, I'll spare you the Karen jokes. This, I really do want to make a Karen joke, but I'll skip it. Uh, it's, in this case, the Karen, of course, is the sane one. I mean, Karen Taylor Robson is a normie, basically. She's a normal Republican. She's talking about things like inflation and the border and, and you know, the water water drought and stuff like that in Arizona. It's, it's a huge deal, right? These are practical things to people. And Carrie Lake is, is you know, fully in the Trump cult, you know, saying things like the, the election is overturned, Joe, Joe Biden, the, the election was stolen, and Joe Biden is not a legitimate president. She's fully in the cult. And that's kind of all she has to sell. Um, and it, the the visits of these two candidates kind of illustrate the difference. It is that Trump goes there and he talks. Every speech he gives is like two hours long. It's like Fidel Castro. <laughs> and it's and it's all about himself. You know, you're supposed to go there. You're supposed to be helping your candidate. But Trump's speech is all about himself. And Pence's speeches are never about himself. He's talking about issues. He's talking about what the party should stand for. He's talking about the candidate that he's, that he's uh, supporting. Well, let's listen to a little bit of sound from this because we have some sound about how he is positioning the campaign against Carrie Lake. And I thought it was really interesting. When Donald Trump and I were preparing for our inauguration in January of 2017, Karen's opponent put on her Facebook page that our inauguration day would be a, quote, national day of mourning and protest. She actually encouraged people to not only join local protests, but boycott TV coverage and use the hashtag, not my president. Really, Carrie? Look, I I'm always happy to welcome converts to the Republican cause. <laughs> but Arizona Republicans don't need a governor that supported Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. So I don't know, Will. He's not talking a lot of policy there. He's still doing this dance where he wants to position himself as the one true conservative. And 
not really drawing any differences about why he's better than Trump on these, you know, moral responsible angles and how he secured the election. Well, to me, the most interesting thing about that that line from Mike Pence is he doesn't go where I would go, right? So I mm-hmm. uh, look, I come from a Democratic household. I understand sort of the Democratic Party and its craziness and its issues. And I look at somebody like Carrie Lake and I think she's nuts. She's nuts. She's deranged or she's, you know, she doesn't accept the legitimacy of the current president of the United States. She peddles lies about the election. So I think of her as a crazy. And that is not the take that Mike Pence comes in with. And to me, the take he comes in with is very enlightening, right? He comes in with, she's a fake. So I think if I were a Republican, if I were one of these, you know, people who, if I were one of my bulwark colleagues and I understood the history of the Republican Party and Republican politics, I would get this, right? He's talking to Republican voters and saying, she's not crazy because honestly, you people, (laughs) he knows that there's a whole bunch of people in Arizona who are going to vote in the Republican primary who are crazy, who are, who believe in Trump's craziness. He's selling the idea that she's a fraud and that she's a closet lib. And she is, right? She is, we have the pictures of her with drag queens before she started going after drag queens. So it, this, the idea that, that Carrie Lake is a fake is probably going to move a lot more votes than my idea that Carrie Lake is a nut job. So all power to Pence if he can move the voters that way. Yeah, without a doubt, there is something going on between Trump and Pence because they have both really stepped up their visibility in giving these speeches and getting out there on the campaign trail. So as the January 6th hearing was concluding on Thursday, Trump went down to the Turning Point USA rally in Tampa on Saturday. He went to Arizona. He's speaking at an America First conference in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday. You also have Pence coming in for a big speech at the Heritage Foundation uh, today. And so what do you think is going on with this? I mean, maybe Trump feels the need to secure his base and get out there a little bit more in light of the hearings. But Pence is, he's really getting out there. He's hes really going for this thing. Yeah, well, uh, Trump, uh, I think, is looking, he, he can see that if he doesn't get in soon, if he sits out, he sees the numbers moving to Ron DeSantis. He sees other people mm-hmm. coming up. The longer the sort of daddy lion sits out, the more the sort of the challengers, you know, get get emboldened. I don't think he can stop them anyway, but that may drive him into the race. I certainly think it's driving him doing a lot of, a lot more speaking. As for Pence, you know, let's be honest, Amanda, every one of these guys, they, you know, there's, they're all afraid that if they, they have a shot at the presidency and they don't take it, they'll have missed their opportunity. So sure. I'm sure that Pence, no matter what he says about Jesus and about goodness is, has personal ambition that he's trying to fulfill here. But I think he's also laying out what it would be like to be uh, a you know a conservative and somebody who supported the quote America first agenda who was supported a lot of Trump policies who supported the judges and the tax cuts and so forth but who is not going to run on the election lies and so the more he can get out there and do that i think the better it is for the country it just provides an alternative to the craziness Hmm. Okay. Well, before I let you go today, Will, I've got to ask you about this. I understand you watched Trump's speech at the Turning Point USA rally. I, I caught some of the clips on on Twitter, and I was going to do a roundup of the craziness, but I just I, I couldn't subject our listeners to that. Not when <laughs> there's actual important stuff to talk about from the fallout from January 6th. But can you just give me your your recollection of the hits or? non-hits. Okay. So, you know, every time Trump gives a speech, I, I, you know, I don't begrudge any of you normal people not paying attention to Donald Trump, right? It's, it drives you nuts. And it's, it's honestly, it's more time than you'd want to spend. The speeches are literally almost two hours long and he pretty much goes over the same ground. But my favorite thing from this speech that Trump gave at the turning point conference over the weekend, he starts going off about the climate hoax. He's doing this in the middle of the biggest heat wave in European history, right? And it's like, I don't know about you, Amanda. It's like 96 degrees in Washington. It's, you know, and much of the country, it's like we're we're in the middle of the hottest part of the year and we're setting records in parts of, you know, the Western world. And the guy starts talking about the climate hoax and he starts talking about the Netherlands. Like there's a climate hoax in the Netherlands. People in the Netherlands and in London and in Spain, I mean, it's crazy over there. So it's everything Donald Trump says is like, a test of how much falsehood you will believe 
you know, will you believe your lying eyes? You're literally sweating. And I'm telling you that there's a climate hoax. So yeah, that was the craziest thing to me about the whole speech. Mm, okay. Well, if you need to pick me up, I will give you this to reflect on as well to our Bulwark listeners. And that is just remind yourself that Steve Bannon was found guilty of contempt of Congress and he is going to jail. It's just a matter of how many days. And so with that, I'll let you go. Charlie Sykes will be back tomorrow. Thank you so much, Will. Thank you, Amanda. You loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Last night, Lisa wanted to clean out the fridge. And I was like, I can't lift anything. I'm not helping. Number one, Lala was told she can't lift anything, you guys. So it's not like she's just like, I'm not lifting anything. She no, but I'm told. not helping. But even my, even my friends know. I'll write you a check. I'll okay. do some Venmo. <laughs> I'll have something wired. <laughs> I am not helping. I don't and like it. Give Them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.